Please note for this next segment, we will leave time for question and answer from the audience, so please use the chat function to ask questions to our moderator, who will direct them to the appropriate panelist. It is my pleasure to now introduce the moderator for this session, Jillian Seaman. Jillian is VP of Sustainability and former Director of Food and Environment at Earth Day Network. She is also a former appointee in the Obama administration, where she oversaw the creation and implementation of government initiatives that focused on sustainable agriculture in food deserts and disadvantaged communities. Jillian, thank you for being here. Over to you. Thank you, Shata. Um, thank you, everyone. Happy Earth Day. Um, I, I would just like to um, say that, you know, ag regenerative agriculture has the power to change the world. But agriculture especially is really facing a trifecta um, of potentially devastating challenges. And what we're seeing in regards to soil capacity development and other factors, um, some experts are predicting that we have less than 60 harvests less, left, which is quite scary to think about. Um, and when we think about how we're gonna feed the world, how we're gonna feed ourselves, regenerative agriculture has that promise to not only feed the world, but to really mitigate the climate crisis that we're in. So we want to get into um, a great discussion with an extremely, extremely talented group of experts um, who will all introduce themselves, talk a little bit about what they are doing um, and how they are literally changing the world and really focusing on human and planetary health. So we will start with John Piotti, who is the president and CEO of American Farmland Trust. And it's so lovely to see everybody. Thank you for being here. Really excited about the discussion today. Um, John, we can kick it off with you. This panel, um, it is a great panel and I think we're gonna have a great conversation. You know, Earth Day really helps the, the public focus attention on the planet's health. And, and I'm so glad to be talking about food and farm issues because they're, they're critical. And yet I feel maybe because they're right under our nose and in our mouths every day, they're kind of overlooked at times, which is really too bad. Um, the organization that I run, American Farmland Trust, was created 42 years ago and was created really because of there was a void that needed to be filled. Um, there was no other national group at that time operating in this space, viewing agriculture and the environment as inseparable, as uh, what we sometimes uh, refer to as two sides of the same coin. Um, we've come a long way in the last uh, 40 some odd years to a point where Farmers and environmentalists are, are no longer at loggerheads as, as, as they were. And, and now environmental groups view farmers as partners and, and many farm groups, even many very conservative farm groups recognize the importance of environmental farming practices. So we've come a long way and part of Earth Day is celebrating how far we've come. And yet on these issues of, of food and farming and their relation to the health of the planet and particularly the climate crisis, um, we are in a very challenging time and there's so, so much work uh, ahead of us. Um, American Farmland Trust is a relatively small organization, about 150 employees, but we've had an outsized impact on both farmland protection and regenerative practices. We've done a lot of this work sort of behind the scenes, um, um, if you will. We're not really a public name. Some people know our no farms, no food bumper sticker, and I always carry one with me, so here, here it is. Um, but they don't know much about the organization behind it. And um, we're really a unique organization in many ways. Uh, in, in, one, in one way is that we approach public policy. We've done a lot of policy work at both the state and the federal level. And we approach it in a more comprehensive manner than uh, some other, other policy groups. We've always had a strong research arm and we try to use science and data to drive policy. Um, and we also do a lot of work 
in the field. We get our hands dirty. And we think that's really critical to have credibility to talk to policy makers. Beyond this, um, we're also somewhat of a unique organization in that we look uh, rather holistically at three interconnected issues. One is the land itself. Uh, we feel very strongly that um, we, we, we need that land not only to grow food, but to provide a whole range of environmental services. Um, the second are the practices that occur in that land. And then the third are the, the people, um, the, the farmers and ranchers who do the work. Um, because if, if they can't make a living and if we can't attract the next generation of farmers onto the land, we're not going to have anyone to follow the best practices um, that, that, we, that we need. Um, so uh, for us, it's, it's really this holistic approach of land, practices, and people. And many people uh, know uh, American Farmland Trust work in one area, but don't, but don't know the other. I'll take just a moment to, to, to speak about our work. Um, on the farmland protection side, um, for a lot of people, this is really what they associate AFT with, and for good reason. Um, we really undertook the, the pioneering projects to use agricultural conservation easements in this country, and then we helped catalyze the creation of uh, 29 state farmland protection programs, a number of land trusts, and of course, the federal farmland protection program. And, that's that's uh, can be adds up to about seven million acres of farmland that we've permanently protected. A, a, a great success, but not nearly what is is needed. We've slowed the rate of farmland conversion considerably um, in the last forty years, from about three million acres um, a year to about seven hundred and fifty thousand acres a year that are being converted to non-farm use. Um, that also is a success but every acre we lose is, is a shame. It's irreplaceable land that, as I said, is not only needed for food, but to provide a whole range of, of, of services. The, the second area that we've been so effective and active in is with uh, regenerative practices itself. Because if you're protecting the land, but um, the topsoil is washing into the rivers, um, if, if the farming practices are polluting the landscape, um, you're not really serving an environmental, an environmental goal. So from the very beginning, AFT has also had a huge focus on this. Again, often behind the scenes. We created the coalition um, that came together to form the 1985 Farm Bill, which was the first to include a conservation title. Um, and that and all of the subsequent refinements um, to programs like CRP and EQIP that some of you may be familiar with. Uh, those all began as AFT white papers and those have really made a, a, a big difference. Again, a combination of, of demonstration projects and research and effective um, advocacy. Um, uh, but when we started working on those practices now almost 40 years ago, we were really thinking about soil health from the perspective of um, making sure that the land was more productive, that um, erosion would be reduced, that water would be retained. We really weren't thinking of carbon sequestration per se, um, uh, but the same practices, any practice that builds soil health by definition is grabbing atmospheric carbon and putting it back uh, into the soil. So we've been in the space for a long time, but it was probably only about a dozen years ago that we started to really specifically apply our work uh, to the climate crisis. And at the federal policy level, um, the real first step in this regard um, to link climate and agriculture was the Waxman-Markey Bill um, of 2008 and 2009. And uh, it passed in the House. Um, AFT had a huge role in that. Um, but sadly, it passed, it failed in the Senate. And that has real, really was a huge setback. And we probably haven't seen or didn't see um, a, a response to that until a few years ago. Um, I would say that um, there was a period of dormancy in federal policy around this issue of climate and ag. And the change probably came, there are several factors, we could talk about that in more detail, but I think the change really came uh, in around 2018. And one of the key factors was one of the IPCC reports that came out that year. And what it said 
quite clearly is that as critically imp as important as it is to reduce our carbon emissions, that alone will not get us to the goals of the Paris Climate Accord. We also have to take atmospheric carbon and trap it in our soils. So um, if there was a bit of a sea change. It was wonderful for an organization like American Farmland Trust that's been um, proposing and pushing and promoting um, regenerative practices for so long. Um, here were policymakers and members of the public um, and businesses increasingly were working with uh, companies like Danone and, and General Mills and Land O'Lakes and others who, uh, who really earnestly um, see the value of their farmers following uh, better, better practices. So it's been a bit of a sea change, but boy, do we have a lot further to go. I think of just one benchmark cover crops. Um, I think about 6% of the farmland in this nation that could be under cover crops um, uh, is currently farmed that way. Um, our research shows that U.S. agriculture could not only be carbon neutral, but could be a carbon sink. And we could be helping offset other economic sectors that potentially could never get there. So um, this is, uh, in my mind, uh, the critical issue of our times. Um, and it's great to be on a panel with many other um, kindred spirits who are working towards the same goal. Thank you so much, John, and thank you for the work that American Farmland Trust is doing. Um, Hunter Lovins, who needs no introduction, but is the president of Natural Capital Solutions. Hunter, over to you. Thanks so much. John mentioned the ability of soil to take carbon out of the air. This potential is enormous. If we farm using regenerative agriculture. And we know how to do this. Farmers are starting to do this because it's more profitable. The way they're farming now, industrialized, mechanized, chemicalized, imposes costs. Eliminate those or reduce them, you cut your costs. This is why the farmer Gabe Brown in North Dakota helped invent this approach to regenerative agriculture, he was going broke. He said, I'll try anything. First, he went to no-till. He stopped breaking the soil, which decarbonizes, denitrifies it. Then he said, how do I get nutrients? How, how, how do I deal with, with all these plants coming in? He planted cover crops, then deep-rooted diverse cover crops. Now his fields are covered with all these cover crops, so he turned out his cows. The cows ate down the cover crops, fertilized the soil. Over about 20 years, he went from a little under 2% soil organic matter to on average 11%, some of his fields as high as 15%. Every 1% increase in soil organic material is five to 10 tons of carbon per acre and 20,000 gallons of water holding capacity. Why does General Mills, which John mentioned, have these principles as the basis of their regenerative agriculture? They hired Gabe. Oh, and Gabe is now profitable. He's rolling climate change backward at a profit. Fast forward to India, where the Green Revolution failed, imposed enormous costs on poor farmers who were then killing themselves, literally drinking their pesticides which they couldn't afford, and killing themselves. A man named Vijay Kumar started working particularly with women in the villages on farms of an acre or less, taking Gabe Brown's principles. Now, they don't eat the cows there, but they use the cows for the manure, for the urine, mix it, and create a mycorrhizal inoculant, a fungal inoculant that jumpstarts the ability of the soil to mineralize carbon, which holds the water, which provides the, the nutrient space for the crops. They've gone from planting once a year, just before the monsoons, which with climate change are now becoming unreliable, to three plantings a year. So they have tripled their income. They no longer use poisons of any sort. They're healthier, their families are healthier, their communities are healthier. 
Vijay calls this community-managed natural farming. In India, Million Belay calls it agroecology. <laughs> Same difference. Million has showed, shown how in Africa, this approach of regenerative agriculture can deliver the promise that the Gates Foundation failed to do. They said, oh, we'll go with the Green Revolution. We'll, we'll double production. No, they didn't. Million has, and it's cheaper for the farmers. It's healthier for the farmers. This is an approach that is increasingly being practiced around the world, can make farm communities healthier, more prosperous, and solve the climate crisis when coupled with renewable energy. Yes, we have to stop emitting fossil carbon, but we also have to soak the excess carbon out of the air. Rodale Institute has shown how to do this with vegetables, with row crops. Savory Institute has shown how to do this with regenerative grazing. We've heard on this program, oh, we have to eat less meat. No, we don't. We have to eat less industrial meat. We have to eat more grass-fed meat because it's the action of the cattle, the goats, the sheep, the grazing animals on the ground that is pulling the carbon out of the air. If you don't believe me, read a paper by Greg Retallick, who shows how this is how the earth decarbonized itself. When we were at a thousand parts per million concentration, well, we weren't, we weren't here. This is pre-humans. What got the earth's concentration of CO2 down to the point where humans could evolve at 280 parts per million were grazing animals. We can replicate this through biomimicry, Janine Benyus' great approach of behaving in the way that nature does. And again, when we do this, we're dramatically more profitable. What can you do? I mean, you may not graze cattle, sheep. You can eat. Eating is an agricultural act, as Wendell Berry put it. What you buy from whom you buy matters a lot. Support your local farmers who are making this transition to regenerative agriculture. And this is what we're doing here in Colorado, working with, with Anthony, whom you'll hear from in a minute, and working with local farmers as part of the Colorado Regenerative Recovery Coalition, a group I helped create, to pull together hundreds of Coloradans to listen to them about what do you want coming out of the pandemic Let's build a regenerative Colorado, not go back to the old normal that was broken. And let's do it with farmers and ranchers and people who live in apartments in the cities and businesses and industry by pulling all of us together to identify our priorities, to set forth policy. So we're working with state legislators, our citizen engagement elicited thousands of ideas of how to build a regenerative Colorado, which we then embodied into bits of legislation, working with the politicians. It's now being implemented in Colorado through the Colorado Department of Agriculture, which is working with Anthony, and through communities across the state who are asking themselves, what kind of a world do we want to live in? Let's build a regenerative future. And when we do, we will achieve real sustainability, shared prosperity on a healthy planet. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, Merlin, over to you. It's so good to see you. I, I'm assuming you're in Iowa. I am in Iowa, and that's why I, I wore my John Deere hat so that nobody would have a mistake as to where I was at. <laughs> well, thank you for being here, and please introduce yourself and, and what you're doing with Regen Iowa and Blue Pan Planet Science Group. Okay, happy to do that. And I could not think of two better people to follow than Hunter and, and John. Um, I've been following Hunter for 40 plus years. While I grew up in Iowa and, and got an education degree here, and by the way, this is my 52nd anniversary of being involved with Earth Day. Because in 1970, my senior year in college, uh, Earth Day began. And on our campus at the University of Northern Iowa, 
uh, we did an event and I was proud to be there and proud to know that it was a Midwest person that it had sponsored and come up with this whole idea. So here we are 50 second, 52 years later uh, and, uh, you know, now taking it to a whole nother level, I do believe. Uh, in following Hunter and John, um, with Regen Iowa, we are regenerative agriculture in action. Uh, I left Iowa shortly after college, moved to Colorado, which is how I, I met Hunter and spent 40 plus years in, in the Boulder, Denver area. Um, and then started coming back to Iowa a little over 10 years ago to uh, work and educate with the, with the governor and education reform and then the Healthy Estate Initiative that was launched uh, and then water quality. Uh, and as I got involved in these things, and first of all, when I first went back to Iowa 40 plus years later, uh, I almost did not recognize this state because agriculture had changed so much. Um, and uh, I was quite frankly, uh, was set back by what um, uh, I went back to, was not happy with it. I'm still not happy with it, which is why uh, I formed Regen Iowa with a number of uh, fellow Iowans. And we're, we've said enough is enough. Uh, we want to accomplish the things that Hunter was just describing. Uh, actually grow food, not just corn and soybeans, uh, and grow uh, food for our communities that has nutrition in it um, and actually can provide the nutrient value that, that we have lost in our agricultural today uh, for a lot of the reasons here again that Hunter mentioned uh, on. Uh, when I started looking at the issues that Iowa was facing and realizing our issues are no different than any other state uh, in the Midwest or across the country, I realized that we didn't really have an ag problem or a healthcare problem or an education problem. We had a systems problem. Uh, and until we started to address that system, I saw us take two steps forward and two steps back. So Regen Iowa is really a systemic approach uh, that starts with water, um, soil, food, and ag, uh, includes healthcare, education, uh, energy, economics, and policymaking. Uh, we have to have some serious policy making changes in the state to incentivize the, the farmers to do the right things uh, so that we can get there. But uh, um, the great thing about Iowa is that we're roughly 1% of the country. Um, and I, I believe if we can address the many issues that we're going to talk about on this panel in Iowa, then we are a model for the rest of the country. And we've already started reaching out to Colorado. We're going to join them in a partnership with Regenerative Ag. We've got people in Missouri, Minnesota, Nebraska, Illinois uh, that want to join us. So we're hoping to put together uh, a, a global collab uh, coalition, if you will, that literally starts in the heartland and in the Midwest uh, to do uh, all of the things that we need to do and, and to transition into this bold new world that we're evolving into. Um, one of the people that I met recently um, is going to follow me, I think, uh, in the next presentation, and that's Elizabeth Pierce. Um, I found her, um, I don't, I'm not sure where we actually uh, first met, but when I saw what she was doing with soil biology uh, and where we were headed with Regen Ag, I said, we have got to work together because you've got the solution that we need in Iowa to rebuild our soil, get that biology healthy, and then sequester the carbon uh, here again as both John and Hunter was talking about at a deep level so that it doesn't end up back in the air but it actually helps grow the food into the nutrition that uh, we have so uh, with all of that um, I'm delighted to be here and I will let it go to the next speaker thank you very much thank you Merlin um, and you've done my job so um, Elizabeth over to you Thank you. Um, we are, I, I'm the founder of SimSoil and we are providing the biological solution for uh, Regen Iowa. And Regen Iowa as a nonprofit has a goal of converting 1 million acres of farmland that is currently in conventional and agrochemical farming to regenerative agriculture. And to, if, if we can succeed in doing that, 
and proving that it works, then we can move very quickly. You know, Iowa is the second largest state in the in the country in terms of food production, and one million acres for Iowa is about seven point eight percent of the total uh, corn uh, farmland that they have. Let me step back for a moment and just talk about sim soil. We're focused on the complete soil ecosystem. Uh, that's how in nature the plants get the nutrient cycling that they need. Uh, some think of it as the plants actually farm the soil microbes that are going to provide them with the nutrients that um, that they need, the, the nitrogen, the phosphorus, the potassium, and other elements as well by absorbing those from the soil and then re reprocessing them in a way that the plants can then absorb into themselves. The soil system is incredibly complex. It's got enormous biodiversity. There are in excess of 20,000 species and a handful of healthy soil. If you were to take all of the soil biology in one acre of land that's healthy, you'd have biology that had the same weight as two full-grown elephants standing upon the soil. Um, in a lot of circles, this is called the soil food web. More recently, people call it the soil, soil microbiome. Very similar in terms of its components to the gut biome. So there's a lot of information coming out about this. But the essence of what we care about is that the microbes leave behind the carbon that they have incorporated in the course of their life. That's actually how carbon sequestration happens. And if you listen to people talk about compost and you talk about ag biologics and a lot of the other uh, information that's out there, they're focusing just on the bacteria, but there's actually nine different types of life. And it's fungi that actually sequesters the majority of the carbon. And it's fungi that is the key to fertility. It's the fungi, the protozoas, the beneficial nematodes. Those are what's impacted by no-till farming. That's why no-till farming works. So the ranchers are ahead of the farmers in terms of this. They've seen that if you shift the soil biology, you increase the protein and the grasses. Alan Savory's done some wonderful work in this area. The plants have biodiversity and that increases the types of foods that are out there and therefore the types of biology. Sim soil and Regent Iowa are focused on talking to Iowa farmers about improving their profitability because until you increase their profitability, you're not really gonna get them to move. So the carbon credits, the credits for soil biodiversity, the uh, grants related to drought tolerance that are in California, sim soil started in California. All of those are great at helping move the profitability of farmers. Our key message is lower input costs and uh, the same or better uh, yields and better nutrient density and better flavor, and that creates greater profitability. Where SimSoil is unique is we have developed ways to grow this complete ecosystem at industrial scale. And this is based on wild source biology. This is based on um, regionally specific uh, microbiome, and we can develop crop specific solutions based on the local biology. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. I love the synergy and the commitment um, from this panel. And to round out the, this incredible panel, um, we have Anthony, who's the executive director and co-founder of Zero Foodprint. Um, Anthony, welcome. Um, really excited to hear you talk about how Zero Foodprint is really mobilizing the food world around agricultural climate solutions. Over to you, Anthony. Thanks, Jillian, and thanks to the Alliance Center. Um, so we've heard a lot about the solutions from the leaders on this panel. And I think basically I'm trying to present the plan to kind of operationalize those solutions and turn regenerative agriculture into the new normal. Uh, because of the global audience, I'm going to kind of answer conceptually first. Um, so imagine if every food company or every government had been taking care of the soil for the last eight decades. Hundreds of gigatons of emissions would still be stored as healthy soil biology, according to the biogeochemists. We'd have nutrient-dense food, ample clean groundwater, we'd have resilient, thriving communities. And this is why since first learning about regenerative agriculture, I basically have 
personally just gone all in. Uh, I'm going to spare you the whole life story today, um, but basically it's so optimistic and so plausible uh, that I think it's the biggest opportunity in food and climate because we can turn back the clock. Uh, these costs have been externalized, but we can internalize them. And it's going to happen one company and one government at a time, large or small. It's going to be good for business and also contribute to community prosperity. So it's basically one big fat win-win-win just waiting for the right incentive structure and policy frameworks to scale. And I think Zero Foodprint is trying to implement those. Um, so we lead public-private collaborations, um, as Hunter mentioned, mentioned, with the Colorado Department of Ag, uh, also with the California Department of Food and Ag, regional governments like City of San Francisco, Boulder County, City of Denver, um, and dozens of leading businesses to scale regenerative agriculture. And basically, we make it possible for an individual or a business or an organization to use a dollar or $100,000 to make direct change in the field. So regenerative ag to me is the best example of global impact through local action. And the change is gonna occur one field at a time, one acre, one practice, one dollar at a time. In an aggregated food economy though, there are so many layers of corporate extraction that the idea of a consumer voting with their dollar almost feels impotent. You know, the idea of supporting the good farmer, the regenerative farmer, there's no supply. But people in organizations want change and they'll pay for change. According to some research, 70% of consumers will pay 35% more for the sustainable choice. So we're out there buying the good stuff, hoping change will occur, but because it's only a weak trickle down kind of pull mechanism mediated by shareholder earnings, change is really slow. And for example, organic is just 1% of US farmland after 50 years. And so as society is embracing and maybe even relying on regenerative agriculture, we're saying we need to find a new way. And so instead of farm to table, Zero Freedman is starting a table to farm movement. It's a strong but af affordable push mechanism and it enables direct change in the field. And so a good analogy would be in renewable energy. You know, there's a lot of work to be done, but there's been rapid progress in the last decade. Instead of kind of begging one business at a time or one homeowner to install rooftop solar, or instead of just buying products that are made with renewable energy, entire cities and counties are committing to shift to 100% renewable energy. And it's simple, you know, citizen sends five bucks a month on the energy bill, something like that, whatever the program involves in that region. And it directly creates the change in energy production. So my message today is basically that a huge corporation or an entire county or state can commit to 100% regenerative agriculture. We can improve the grid of food. But of course the question is how? Um, so Zero Free Print is making this real. Uh, we're already working with local governments, local soil experts, and businesses to make this kind of transformative change. Improving the grid is possible, it's plausible, it's even radically scalable. So last year, we also launched affiliate programs in Asia, Denmark, and Germany, and started farm projects in Colorado. Uh, we're going to expand to Georgia and the Northeast this year. And what we do is basically coordinate locally focused regenerative economies that can use even just a penny from a purchase. We aggregate those pennies into a fund, and then that's enough for a $20,000 compost project or to plant $10,000 worth of trees or cover crops, you know, basically based on whatever projects have the most climate benefit for that region. Dozens of stakeholders and carbon experts came together to create a system for this kind of optimal and equitable selection of projects, improving the grid. And we even have ordinances ready for local policymakers to level up the programs from a few businesses opting in to everyone having an opt out. So basically we can include tiny but crucial fees for regeneration across the entire economy. You know, imagine if a dollar per month on the trash bill was going to regenerate that or 1% on your Amazon or McDonald's purchase, you know, generating billions of dollars per year to change acres. The big global climate research like Project Drawdown finds that 1% of GDP redirected toward the best solutions would be enough to lower global temperatures. So to put that another way, going from 0% for climate to 1% towards regenerative ag and other solutions could still save us, but we have to start now. So for regenerative ag to become the new normal, all we have to do is team up with farmers and ranchers to grow better food and restore the climate, and it can happen one penny at a time. Thanks. 
Thank you. Um, I know we've spent a lot of time introducing ourselves, but let's get into a discussion. And I do want to ask the panelists, just due to time, um, if we could keep our responses to about a minute we, so we can all um, have time for the questions, a little discussion, and closing remarks. So the first question I want to go to John. John, you talked about the IPCC report, and but I want to talk about the one that was recently released um, in its latest report on climate change and land use. The urgency of putting carbon back into the soil is greater now more than it has ever been. Can you tell us how AFT is addressing um, land use under under pressure currently? Yeah, it's a it's a great question, and I think that reports in everyone's everyone's mind. I could take a lot of time say getting into this, and you asked me not to, so I'll just hit a couple of highlights. Uh, point number one is is our focus and the focus of many other organizations that we work on it work with at this point is really to scale things up. And we have the tools. This point you've heard you've heard this from the panel that we know what we need to do. The issue is we're not doing it at great enough scale. So on multiple levels, AFT through our regional offices, um, through some of our national work, we're trying to scale up. But the real point I want to make about that report is although it was um, quite concerning in many ways, there was also a thread of real hope in that report. And it was that the latest science shows that um, we can actually reverse temperature increase over time if we ultimately get enough carbon back in the soil. So for those people who are now just focused on climate adaptation, say, no, folks, we can mitigate this thing. Don't, don't, don't forget the prize that is in sight. We can, we can heal this planet through regenerative agriculture. Absolutely. Thank you so much, John. Hunter, according to the estimates compiled by the FAO, by 2050, we will need to produce 60% more food to feed a world population of 9.3 billion people. Doing the farming as usual approach um, would take a really heavy toll um, on our natural resources. How can we feed the world with regenerative agriculture? Industrial farming is failing. We have hundreds of hungry people, hundreds, thousands, millions of hungry people. Climate change is just going to make this worse. We have famine right now in the Horn of Africa famine threatening millions, billions of people around the world. And at the same time, we are spending a million dollars a minute subsidizing industrial agriculture, which is failing. So step one, let's take a little bit of that money and start putting it into regenerative agriculture, which as in the case of Vijay Kumar, can triple production just through shifting from industrial to community managed natural farming. Let's start using the best of what we know to enable smallholder farmers who today produce 70 to 80% of the food around the world to do so a bit more productively. People say, oh, it's the industrial American farmer who's going to feed the world. No, it's not. It's the smallholder farmer learning how to implement more regenerative practices that will feed the world. Don't have to believe me. This is the conclusion of a report called Wake Up Before It's Too Late by the UN's Conference on Trade and Development, which said in terms, industrial agriculture cannot feed the world. It's going to be the smallholder farmers. And so we need to provide them around the world with how to do this. So uh, a group that I work with called Now Partners is in the process of producing interviews with people like VJ and Million and farmers in Brazil and Gabe Brown in the Dakotas, people from around the world who are doing this, succeeding in this, we call it the regenerative future of food. Wait for it. We have the bar. Thank you so much. And with that in mind, Merlin, um, our current agricultural model has a very hierarchical top-down structure. What does regenerative agriculture do to level the structures and really distribute power evenly? Um, 
Well, that's exactly what it, what it does do. I mean, it, it's interesting. When I first started uh, my Regen Iowa initiative about seven years ago, there was a, a lot of resistance uh, to the fact that uh, Regen Ag was, was not profitable enough and it, it was too much work. But it, it's like we have crossed over that industrial chasm to the point to where um, we've got this renewed energy in regards to regenerative ag. I, for example, am, am sitting and I, I chose to be out here to make my broadcast. I'm in, in Coon Rapids, Iowa, uh, out in rural Iowa, just an absolutely beautiful spot out here. Uh, and I'm sitting in the um, center of the White Rock Conservancy, uh, which um, is an indicator of how I think things are starting to change in Iowa uh, and across the country. Uh, we, for example, put together or the White Rock Conservancy uh, is the owners of a soil health conservation easement, the first of its kind in the country, as far as we know, uh, and the first, certainly the first of its kind in the state. And what that easement allows uh, has allowed um, the White Rock Conservancy and the, and the founders of uh, it, the, the Garst Foundation, is to uh, allow them to sell off acres of land, um, but uh, that easement would allow uh, the principles of soil health to be continued. The three primary principles are continuous living roots, mitigation of soil disturbance, and a mitigation of soil erosion. So it's that kind of initiatives that are starting to come to the forefront and take the lead in this whole regenerative ag movement that we're talking about. Uh, and we're happy to, to see that happen in Iowa, uh, thanks to, to the Garst family and the White Rock Conservancy. But having said all that, that means that leveling the playing field here and, get, and empowering the farmers with, with new tools and technologies, helping them create more profitability with the regenerative types of things that we're discussing on this program, ultimately means that uh, the farm to the table and then the table to the farm, which Anthony is, is helping uh, uh, launch across the country, uh, means that healthier food is gonna be on the table uh, for our families uh, and that means that we can address one of the biggest challenges we have here in Iowa, which is health care alone, primarily due to the fact uh, of the way that we do agriculture. So um, I think the hierarchy uh, is on notice that it is changing, that we the people are stepping forward, wanting regenerative practices, not only to address climate change and to save our planet, but quite frankly, to save uh, the human species and uh, we're all on this panel, just, just the tip of the iceberg, uh, but it's headed your way. It is the tip of the iceberg. Thank you, Merlin. And Elizabeth, just talking, talking about that, and you know, we've heard a lot about carbon sequestration, um, but I, if you could just spend a minute talking about measuring soil carbon and the environmental benefits. Um, a lot of times, you know, we're getting a lot of um, responses is, what does that actually mean and can we actually achieve it? If you could spend a little time talking about that. Yes, the answer is yes, we can achieve it. You know, the goal of Regen Iowa is to get a million acres uh, in converted to Regen Ag by 2025. And that's because the average regenerative farm has 200 plus microns of carbon per gram. And um, if the back of my envelope says that, you know, if we were to do 20 million acres, that would completely offset the carbon footprint of the United States. So this is a very achievable goal. And the question is, how fast can we get there? There's some really interesting technologies um, and it's, it's an evolving field of how you measure it. Earlier, um, uh, Hunter and I were speaking about the ecological uh, outcome verification system of, um, of uh, the Savory Institute. There's the Haney method. Uh, there's a number of people working with satellites and with software. I personally am a big advocate of the microbiometer, which is a very low cost test that farmers can do in the field with a smartphone app. And that product, um, Merlin's actually showing that, um, that product is a wonderful tool for farmers. Uh, you can look at the difference between land that has less than 100 um, microns, which is typical per, per, of carbon per gram, which is typical of most 
um, industrial farms, and you can look at plants that are grown literally inches away that are, and I'll, I'll post a picture of this on the uh, We Don't Have Time website, and I'd love to use that platform to answer questions from your audience, but the plants are almost unrecognizable as the same species because of the fungal content and the other microbes that are in the soil. And unfortunately, from my perspective, investors are much more interested in spending money on technology to measure this than in actual solutions that can speed that process up, whether they call it bio um, biomimicry or, or other things, it all comes down to growing the biology and replacing those ecosystems in the soil. Thank you, Elizabeth. And Anthony, we've heard a lot about the importance of regenerative agriculture. Can you explain how zero food print can help scale the movement from advocates to a new normal? Uh, sure. I, I first really learned about that um, as a chef. And so we were running a restaurant, The Perennial, uh, and we were, you know, really championing regenerative ag. This started back in 2015, you know, before most people had even heard the term, I think. And, you know, we're in San Francisco. It's kind of like farm to table uh, everywhere. You know, people almost have like farm to table fatigue. Um, you know, but so we'd be serving uh, sourdough bread made from Carnza, this perennial grain. You know, hey, this could change all of agriculture. Uh, serving, you know, beef from a carbon farming project where they were doing holistic grazing, like Hunter was referring to, plus compost application. And so I think on one-tenth of the ranch, after a few years, the project had already taken in as much carbon as not burning a million gallons of gas. You know, so radically climate beneficial. The problem is in the U.S., there's 760 million acres of, you know, pasture and rangeland with cattle on it. A lot of it goes into the feedlot, et cetera. You know, we don't approve of that, but it started to feel like there was no way for, you know, that $1 from the consumer to make enough change. And beg the consumer, tell them this amazing story, hope that they spend that extra dollar, and then it might end up getting the farmer a few cents. You know, maybe the farmer's just using it to make ends meet, this and that. We know farming's tough. But really there was like no way that that couple cents was ever gonna incentivize the farmer's neighbor. And so that again is, you know, I guess I think it really like crystallized for me when some soil scientists told me like, you know, hey, dude, you know, organic is 1% of acres after 50 years, right? And so, you know, we stopped kind of bending over backwards, trying to beg the consumer for the dollar and instead tried to focus on this structural change and this kind of collective action. Thank you so much, Anthony. Um, we have spent a lot of time talking about this day, but I, we could spend all day, all month, all year talking about regenerative agriculture. But in the last couple minutes that we do have together, um, I would like just to hear some closing remarks from our, from our panelists. Um, just a little bit about regenerative, what regenerative agriculture means to consumers and how consumers can, can play a role. Um, Hunter, you did mention, you know, it's the power of the dollar, right? Um, it's what we buy. Um, but if you, if each of you can spend 30 second, 30 to 45 seconds in the last few minutes that we have just for some closing thoughts, um, we would really appreciate it. Um, John, we could start with you. Sure. Well, um, I, I always uh, resist simple solutions. But I, I do think in some ways we overcomplicate this. Really what we need to do is figure out mechanisms to uh, uh, compensate farmers for not only growing food, but for the full range of environmental services that they provide. And if, if we can get to that point, other things will take care of themselves because the best practices do pay for themselves. So how do we get there? Um, and the answer is both a combination of government policy and market forces. Um, we are terrible as a nation on understanding multivariables. So that, maybe the classic is diet and exercise, right? We can't figure out that you have to do both to get to the outcome. But where that, I deal with policy all the time. And there's this group of people who think policy is the answer. And there's another group of people who say, no, Government just screws everything up. The answer is always in the market. And the real answer is you need both. And when operating at the best, they're synergistic and they reinforce each other. So there are issues with measurement, like Elizabeth pointed out. 
let those things that we know are good practices, but you can't quantify at a level that you can get a market to pay for it, let government support those items. And let yeah. the items that lend themselves to carbon trading or to the general mills of this world getting value in the in the in the supply chain, let them work on that. Yeah, but if I we agree. Just, we all we all have to work together. We all we're all part of the solution. So exactly. Um, so we're all part of the solution. I will stop there. Thank you. All. <laughs> Thank you, John. <laughs> Hunter, closing remarks. Sure. Do one thing. Ask yourself every day, what's your dot? Do one thing. Here are two things that you can consider. We're told plant trees. If you've ever seen a tree blow over, look at the roots. The roots are tiny compared to the biomass of the tree. Trees burn in forest fires. They rot if they just lay there and release the carbon. Grass, the biomass is below ground. When things are grazing on it, the roots are sloughing polysaccharide sugars, feeding the microbiological community that Elizabeth's been talking about. So don't plant a tree, buy locally raised grass fed chicken, pork, beef, lamb. Connect with your local farmer. Do one thing. Two, where's your money? What are you invested in? A group of us put together a little exchange traded fund change finance change hyphen finance.com we offset the carbon to the point that your the companies that you're holding to the extent you're holding them are carbon negative through a group called grassroots carbon that's taking the money and spending it on regenerative grazing those are two things you can do today thank you hunter the power of of our dollar um merlin Closing thoughts from you. Okay, um, my closing thought takes me back to um, when I graduated from high school in 1965, and 4% of Iowans uh, had a chronic disease back then. Um, what do you think it is today? I'll leave that question out there, but I'm gonna answer it as well. It is now approaching 60% and surpassing that. So what are we doing different today or what has caused this increase um, in chronic disease across our state and across our, our country, uh, we've got to address that because while we're talking about climate change and, and climate uh, uh, crisis and agricultural change and so forth, perhaps the biggest crisis we have in front of us in America um, and in the world is our health care. Uh, and so if we, re we adopt regenerative agricultural practices, we can fix healthcare by have, providing food as medicine. Food is medicine, ladies and gentlemen. We have forgotten that in part because when I was growing up on a farm back here, all food was organic. Uh, and so we've got to get uh, back to that. Uh, and I'm very hopeful that um, as organizations like those of us that are on this panel come together and start collaborating and working together, which is what Hunter and I and John and uh, Elizabeth and Anthony are all committed to. Uh, we can accelerate what we're doing, learn from each other. We don't have to reinvent the wheel in every state. When one state learns something, we can share it with the others. That's what Regen Iowa is about. It's really a, a national model and a global model. And we're looking to do it with all the people on this panel. Thank you, uh, hope you all join us. Thank you so much. Um, Elizabeth, just quickly about, we have about, we don't have much time left. We have less than a minute. So 30 seconds. Sure, what is sure, one, no problem. Just closing thoughts. Um, closing thoughts. Are, I keep coming back to the soil biology and you can, wherever you are in the world, find practitioners of Korean natural farming, soil food web, permaculture design. There are a number of indigenous traditions. They all are techniques for improving the, the ecosystem and the biodiversity of the soil. Find those practitioners in your community, for your garden, for your farm, use them. That's the key. Thank you. Anthony. Uh, my one thing would be team up with farmers and ranchers to take the next step. So don't just buy from the good farmer, help the good farmer get better, help the conventional farmer start making the switch. 
and aside from buying, I think the big one is compost. Um, I'm gonna plug our program here, but basically just society needs to start viewing compost as equally as important as renewable energy and just start making major policy shifts to compost and build up healthy soil that way. Thank you so much. It sounds like we all have our marching orders. And I want to thank the panel for, for joining us today on Earth Day. We know that Earth Day is every day. It's not just April 22nd. Um, so thank you, everyone. Thank you. We don't have time. And also, don't like, like Elizabeth said, join the platform. Um, she will be sharing a, a lot of pictures and information that will be very useful. And if you want to know more about uh, the regenerative agri agriculture program at, at uh, Earth Day, please visit earthday.org. Thank you so much, everyone, and happy Earth Day. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone.